Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gary Garrison. I should be Gary Garrison. He, he's uh, introduced all these events so beautifully so far. Uh, but I don't really have any uh, uh, Dramatist Guild announcements to make, so I guess that's why I'm not here. Uh, oh, I know. Uh, my name is Rick Davis, and I'm the co-artistic director of Theatre of the First Amendment, which is one of our co-hosts. <laughs> Needless to say, this has been a thrill all, uh, all uh, actually months and months in the planning, and then these last few days have been just exciting. The presence of so many great minds and so many great talents and so much wonderful conversation has uh, truly been uh, transformative. I hope, certainly for us, and I hope for, for many of you. It's my uh, privilege and challenge and honor and terrifying duty to, uh, they use the word moderate, but I think that's probably the wrong word, uh, to wrangle or to just get out of the way of 16 extraordinary panelists that you see before you. It looks a little bit like a, a Republican a primary debate uh, set, but we, we will we'll try to keep the tone civil uh, and uh, it'll be great. I, without further ado, I want to start introducing these folks and I want to give one more shout out to Gary because he set the running order of this thing and of the many possible running orders for a group of distinguished artists, alphabetical order was chosen. And uh, it's, it's superb. So I will introduce the artists one by one, uh, uh, and I'll try to do it. A Broadway composer, lyricist for such works as Working and Sweet Smell of Success, Craig Carnelia. <laughs> of The Bubbly Black Girl Meets Her Chameleon Skin, playwright and musical theater writer, Kirsten Child. <laughs> Composer lyricist for the Tony-winning The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, playwright Carol Hall. <laughs> Producer, dramaturg, and associate artist with the Sundance Theater Lab, Mame Hunt. <laughs> Venus in Fur and New Jerusalem playwright David Ives. <laughs> Book writer and lyricist for the Tony Award winning musical You're in Town, playwright Greg Cotis. <laughs> Executive director of the National New Play Network, Jason Lowith. I'm Obie Award winner for My Left Breast and Nasty Rumors and Final Remarks, playwright Susan Miller. <laughs> Pulitzer Prize and Tony winning playwright, librettist, and lyricist for such plays and musicals as The Color Purple, The Secret Garden, and Night Mother, Marsha Norman. <laughs> Artistic Director of DC's Theatre J, Ari Roth. <laughs> Executive Director for Business Affairs of the Dramatists Guild of America, Rolf Sevish. <laughs> Grammy and Academy Award winning composer and lyricist for such shows as Godspell, Pippin, and the current Broadway hit Wicked, and the president of the Dramatists Guild of America, Stephen Schwartz. <laughs> Artistic director of DC's Woolly Mammoth Theater, Howard Schallwitz. The Jefferson Award winning playwright of such plays as Flyovers and The Value of Names, author and educator, Jeffrey Sweet. Award-winning composer and lyricist of such musicals as Big Red Sun and Hello My Baby, Georgia Stitt. <laughs> Pulitzer Prize, Tony, Drama Desk winner for I Am My Own Wife and book writer for the musicals Grey Gardens and The Little Mermaid, Doug Wright. <laughs> That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the, uh, the format here is completely unknown to all of us. Right? Those are the ground rules. Uh, but I'm going to uh, throw out a question or two, or as I told Gary earlier, press play. And the intention here is to have a free-flowing conversation among the panel in response to my questions or not. Uh, and then, as time permits, and we will make sure that it does permit, engage in another one of the really wonderful Q&A sessions with you all that have been characteristic of this conference. So this is, in some ways, the 11 o'clock number of this conference. This is, this is the title number, because the conference is called Playwrights in Mind, a national conversation, and this is headed as the national conversation. So here we are, having a national conversation. What kind of a national conversation should we envision together is something I just want us all to be thinking about for the next hour and 15 minutes or so. So here's my first sort of softball question. Softball question, yes. Well, the reason I say, the reason I pause, and this is my last joke for the night, I promise, inspired by David's talk earlier, a few jokes always go down, but I was thinking as I was reading all these wonderful names, you know, and you start to get into a rhythm, and now I know what the guy at Yankee Stadium feels like when he announces a batting order. It's, you know, it's that kind of all-star lineup, that, and the applause, and fantastic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, here's the softball question, but I, but I hope it's a, a stimulating one. If you, if you all were to sort of look at the art the state of the art of playwriting and play production. And I'm going to use the term living playwright production instead of new play production because new play production has a, is kind of a subcategory of living playwright production, right? Uh, and it has some, some other edges to it. If you think about taking a snapshot of where we are, just a one, two, three year snapshot, looking a little bit back, maybe looking a little bit ahead, what are the things in any of your worlds as writers, directors, producers that have started to go better where you see signs of progress, signs of positive change, signs of new possibilities. And of course, that question has a flip side, which we'll get to later. But let's start with the first part. And anybody, jump in. <laughs> anybody at all? David? As an attorney, we're trained never to look at the bright side. <laughs> I'm happy to say something, um, maybe that's provocative, I don't know, um, which is that I, I actually think we're at a point where theater can learn from Hollywood in some interesting ways. I, I used to hear um, 10 years ago playwrights talking about how Hollywood was what they did for money, but then they came back to uh, theater because it's where their heart was. And now increasingly I'm hearing, uh, hearing writers talk about the level of satisfaction in their work with Hollywood in relation to teamwork, in relation to writing for actors who they know and, uh, and whose work they understand, in relation to camarad camaraderie with their fellow uh, writers. And, and I'm interested in how some of those values, uh, in, a, in a way we can actually uh, uh, use in, in a useful way in the theater. I'm very interested in the question right now of how writers can be embedded in companies of actors, which was the dream of the group theater, which I think is a field that, as a field, I think is something that we've abandoned. And I, 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 my most satisfying experiences over the past couple of years are ones where I felt like I was approaching a, a deeper level of collaboration among playwright, director, actors who all really knew each other. Good. Howard, I'll, I'll just actually, I'll jump on that because um, today I, I was doing a presentation about creating a dramatic or drama web series. And uh, I've also done work in Hollywood television and film, but I have found something that I think uh, offers a really um, great opportunity for playwrights. And you know, I'm also asked, do you think that the web is going to usurp theater or film or television? I don't think it's going to usurp anything, but I think it's going to be another influence. And our, one of the series that I have in England of me is what you were talking about. It is like a company. And, and we are doing it ourselves, and there's great camaraderie. Um, they're you know, actors that we've grown with for three years, which is like the best of television and what I've always dreamed of for the theater. And I'm thinking, and there are more theater artists doing it. This doesn't preclude writing plays. What it does is while you're waiting for the phone to ring or someone to say yes, you can do this other thing. Um, and I think I've learned a lot from young people um, who get together and have formed theater companies. Well, this is kind of like that. And I, I, I see them as working together. Um, and I'm very encouraged and excited by it. I'll jump on both of you. 
<laughs> metaphorically. Uh, uh, collaboration uh, amongst producers in support of new plays and playwrights is something that clearly the past three years has, uh, uh, past three, four years has been a big deal uh, that I've witnessed through the National New Play Network. Uh, our offices are housed at Woolly Mammoth, so Howard and I talk about collaboration a lot. Uh, but, uh, but NNPN and, and uh, through its continued Life of New Plays Fund has supported 25 productions in 100 Rolling World premieres over the past four or five years. Uh, figuring out ways that producers and institutions can assume risk together uh, as a way of minimizing its individual potential impact on any of them is really important for the field or certainly what, what we've seen. I'd like to pick up on something that you were talking about and take it just a little bit further. Um, we lost Lanford Wilson uh, a few months ago, but it was reminding me that his career really started because he had a group of actors to write for it. In fact, he wrote uh, his first big hit, Hot El Baltimore, under an injunction from Marshall Mason saying, look, all these people have put sweat equity into our theater, you have to write parts for them because they painted, you know, the walls. And Lanford, you know, responded by writing a play for that company. And of course, more recently, we have uh, Tracy Letts who wrote for a company and had his big breakthrough hit uh, with August Osage County. I wish there were more opportunities for writers to write for companies of actors. We know that Shakespeare wrote for companies of actors. We know that Moliere did. I think there's something great about writers being embedded with acting companies instead of us just sort of showing up uh, new in the city, being put in uh, the studio apartments and uh, um, you know, just being a guest for three weeks. Uh, I think it's a lot more fun to be part of a, a community to write for a company. And I, I'd love to see more of that. I, I also would just add, the most heartening thing I can see is that uh, for the last two days you've been hearing from a lot of us, and I think we've, we've told you that playwriting is in many ways no longer a tenable profession. It's the purview of hobbyists. That we tend to write for a rarefied elite that can only afford our extravagant ticket prices. That if you're a woman, your chances of getting produced are significantly less than if you're a man. And there are presumably still about 300 of you sitting out there who still want to write plays. <laughs> sort of our only hope for the uh, continuance of the profession, really. But I think it's a profound one because we all face those obstacles and we still confront the blank page. And I think that's uh, significant. That sounds like a summative kind of comment. Uh, but, does it, but does anyone want to jump on it? No? All right, well, I have, I have a few more, but then, you know, I uh, want to give the conversation its own head as well. Um, terrific. So, on the first night of this conference, Molly Smith, in her very inspiring keynote address, uh, talked a lot about some of these issues, actually. Talked a lot about uh, artists, playwrights, as a member of a community, both an institutional community, in her case, obviously, Arena Stage, and also, in slightly more abstract terms, it, the playwright is a member of a larger community, be that an educational institution, be that a, a town, a city, uh, a village, a region, what, what have you. Sort of following up on some of your remarks uh, just a few moments ago, can you, can you think about, visualize, or report experiences of ways in which you have had, either as producers or as playwrights, fruitful sort of community building experiences, how you, how you have insinuated yourself into a community or been invited into a community and helped shape it or, or give it a new meaning? Well, I'll just say briefly, I'm one of the lucky ones that I think I'm in the only theater that has a resident ensemble of writers that's been going as long as it has, which is Victory Gardens, and there have been about a dozen of us, so that's been very sustaining. It's going to be an open question whether uh, that will continue to be in place there, but it's certainly been a big part of my life is to have that community of writers. Others. We can define community as broadly as you want. I, I, I want to speak to um, an advent of the playwright as producer in two of the most high profile hirings of the season in Baltimore Center Stage and in Chicago's Victory Gardens. You had playwrights assuming the role of artistic director. And uh, I think it's significant. Uh, I myself am a playwright, producer, and I think our engagement with an audience comes from the playwright's impulse to um, be in conversation with our audience. I think that's the natural 
um, role that a writer has. You throw down a proposition and it gets debated, it gets well argued, and the purpose is to um, open up the minds of the audience and uh, invite further conversation. I think these two hires, and there will be more coming, um, point the way to the empowering of the writer to help chart the course of um, the future of the American theater, not only through the plays they write by themselves, but through the plays they help shepherd along. Uh, I, I know that the, I teach at Juilliard, I mean, I know I teach at Juilliard, um, <laughs> um, for 18 years, and people are, are quite often ask us, what, what is the reason that you and Christopher, why have you been so successful? Why have your students won so many prizes? Why do they run so many TV shows? Why do their plays get done? Why do they run? And the answer has nothing to do with what Christopher and I say in the classroom for the most part. It has to do with the fact that we, we grow them in a community of actors. That they come up to the drama department at the Juilliard School and the actors are all there all the time circling around them so the playwrights <laughs> like it and romance with them and have fights with them and you know watch them all the time and it very much is a that's how they grow up is watching actors and they then move out into the world with them i mean adam rap took i don't know how many and you know people and that that's that's really a model i think that that universities should look at instead of you know, the, there's another university in New York that, for example, has musical theater department is in another whole building from where the MFA in playwriting is, and and the actors are in a locked floor, as far as I tell. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that's not a that's not a way that you can train writers. You know, writers have to learn exactly how much actors can do so that they know what not to write. And I think that that, you know, that model of, of raising writers with actors at the same time is a really good one, as opposed to, you know, academic arenas where those, where that's a fear that, you know, the actors could get contaminated by new writers and <laughs> contaminated by young actors. And it's terrific for the actors, obviously, as well, to be constantly confronting new material. Uh, and if I take your point uh, correctly, it's, that sort of culture that's established at Juilliard then moves out into the world, into the profession, and, and keeps self-replicating. That's right. So very that's encouraging. Right. I mean, just at Manhattan Theatre Club this week, a play opened that had a Juilliard writer written it, at, who has written it, and a Juilliard writer actor in it. I mean, for both of them. So in a sense, it it does it does work that way. I mean, and, and interestingly enough, when they're in California, as they are now on some ten television series. Um, which I applaud. I mean, I'm glad that the, I, we knew all along that those weren't people, weren't, we didn't all, we didn't have all pure playwrights in the room. Um, and I think that's a thing that, that's, that's fine. Um, there's good storytelling and there's good dramaturgy and there's good, you know, it's all good. But the fact that the actors are there, that's what makes the thing live. That's like the old days at Actors Theatre of Louisville when it was all just hot all the time. So, it's good. <coughs> Anybody else have a, a, a thought about community either shaping or being shaped by? I'd like to say that um, I'd like to expand the word community to the global community. Yeah. And I think, as Susan was talking about, taking the taking back your power and finding ways that you can create situations for yourself while you're waiting for something else. The internet has probably provided this huge community of support for young writers, especially who have no other outlet for getting their work seen. And um, and. Uh, I recently traveled abroad and was amazed at how much access those people, in, I was in Australia, how much those students knew of my work because of the videos of me performing in concert and other people singing my songs and that sort of thing were on the internet. And now given that I spent the whole afternoon talking about copyright infringement, this is a loaded answer to that question. <laughs> the videos that I put up and that, that's what I'm championing in that case. But there is a, um, I have been able, this also speaks to your first question about how things are improving, I have been able to reach a much broader audience because of the internet and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and those sorts of things than I would have if I were just sitting alone trying to find venues or places where I could sing and play my songs. Um, just to add to that, I mean, our show has over almost 9 million views worldwide in two and a half seasons. Um, and as I said, it feels like we are all working together and, and, and it, it is what Marsh is talking about, not divided up. I'm 
uh, I, and the reason I, and to get back to community, the reason I, I was sort of ready to say yes to this is also because of the day that I woke up and knew that I was going to perform a play I had written. Um, and it suddenly broke down all kinds of barriers. I think as playwrights, we're often passive in that way that actors are not in terms of getting work for ourselves. But what I wanted to say was when I took that play all around the country, I was alone. I didn't have anybody to go out with afterwards. And so, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to resent my parents for being those kind of people who talked to anyone. I finally got it. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I was everywhere. But I found out a lot about and instilled myself into those communities I was in. Also, because I was interviewed for a uh, newspaper, oh, we've all had this experience, I think, but interviewed for newspapers, which are now, uh, all of those, a lot of them are shut down. But uh, I, think, I think you learn by getting involved, as you were saying, as a producer or as a performer or as quit putting your stuff you know, out there um, so that it does reach a global audience. I definitely feel, um, I hate to say this, but I do feel more a part of the web community now than I do the theater community only because it isn't up to me in the theater community as to whether I get a play done and whether I can put myself out into the community. But this, I've taken charge of. Now, I wish and I hope there's a way we can start doing that uh, again in, in, the, in the theater. How does anybody's, uh, we haven't heard from the left wing here. Uh, <laughs> stage left. Yes, yes. Um, but I, so I'd like to make sure everybody uh, gets a chance to weigh in on a subject of interest. Uh, we'll hit on one eventually here. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, the, in how a community feeds back to you as artists. How do you know, whether you're on Broadway or on the internet or in a regional theater, how do you, how, how do you hear those voices? Of, and, and are they telling you anything useful? Are they calling you to do work that matters to them? Do you hear that? Do you care about that? Uh, or or is the, what, what's the nature of that transaction, the feedback from the community? Well, speaking to the left wing, um, you know, I, I think just, just the idea of community, not, not necessarily a geographic community like part of a town, but we're sort of, I don't know, I mean, it, for, for me going into theater was all about joining a community that existed, not a, not a geographic one, but sort of like people of the same tribe where, you know, all of a sudden you discover that there are other people like you that like goofing off and, and think that's, that's really important. Um, so, I mean, in my experience, I mean, my, my, my most, my sharpest memories of community have to do with things like um, working in storefront theater in Chicago where it is, it was, and I imagine it still is, like what you described in the web where you band together into a group of however many people, you declare yourself a theater company, you rent a storefront and you declare that a play as legitimate as anything on Broadway. And, and so, so there. Um, and I guess there's, there are a few guarantees, very few guarantees doing theater. There's no guarantee of production or money or uh, a claim or any of that. But one thing I think that you can guarantee yourself is if you, wherever you are, if you seek out other people, theater people who understand the, the importance and the magic of, of what it is to band together to put something up and sort of cast that spell on an audience, that is guaranteed, I think. So that's sort of something to bank on. And, and um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of, the, that's the big payoff, I think. I guess, um, talking about community, uh, the piece that I wrote, uh, which is called The Bubbly Black Girl Sheds Her Chameleon Skin. <laughs> she meets it and then she sheds it. <laughs> it was actually about, um, feeling an outsider in one's community. So I, I'm, I kind of approached it from a different way. But what I found out in the doing of it was that, that a lot of people felt what I felt. And that included, and I was specifically dealing with the African American community. And I felt that a lot of, I found out that a lot of people in the African American community felt as I felt. And not only that, people outside the community knew just what I was talking about. So I'm not really quite sure uh, you know, that I actually went in this 
trying to, I guess I was trying to find out how to fit in the community, but it wasn't a, an impulse to, to talk about the community. Yeah. Can I follow up real quick on how, how did those, how did that information come back to you? How did, how did you get that response? Um, I did the piece before it was done at Playwrights Horizons as a as a musical. Um, I did it as a performance piece in a place called Dixon Place. And all right, fantastic a place for for people to um, do all sorts of kinds of performances. Um, and this Asian man came up to me and said, "That is my story." And then I realized I had really figured out something about community and about out being an outsider. Great. Anybody else on the, on the feedback loop? Well, um, I, I hate to say nice things about the internet because it's so burdensome um, in, in so many ways, but I know something that has changed for me recently that, that um, occurs to me based on your question, which is that um, when, when I first started out, the only way you really got response or felt response other than anecdotally somebody stopped coming up to you on the street or occasionally someone writing a letter was through critics and through a box office, neither of which feels very good. Um, but now I get emails from all over the world um, from people who say, I heard such and such a song, and just kind of what you were saying, uh, Kirsten, and, and it really spoke to me, or it had this effect on me, or this thing changed my life, or, or et cetera. And, and it came as a shock to me, actually, when this first started happening a few years ago, that people were actually listening. I suddenly thought, oh my God, people, people are actually, they're actually listening to what I'm saying, and they're, and they're hearing these, these words and responding to them, I, I guess I better be careful and, and, try, and, and try and, you know, I, I can't get away with stuff because people are actually hearing it. But that kind of direct um, realization that there was an audience that I was speaking to um, that, that was not critics and, and was not about um, how many tickets were sold, that, I have to say that that's been incredibly heartening. Um, in, in an extremely disheartening profession. Yeah, that's true. I was just going to say, Rick, I think the theater institutions, uh, or I hate that word institutions, but the theaters, I think can do a lot to kind of create this more complex feedback loop. And I think there's been a tendency, I mean, those of us who are artistic directors, we're dealing with feedback every single day. We're on the front lines. You know, if we put up a play, the playwright might be gone. Uh, back to New York or Chicago or whatever, but we're, we're, we're dealing with that feedback every single day. But we have a, 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 really briefly, we have a new function at Woolly Mammoth, it's a senior staff function called Connectivity, and uh, which is all about kind of creating that loop between, between the work and the community. And it really depends on playwrights who are willing to be part of that cycle and have a thick skin about it. But it also, uh, the, the, key, the key concept of connectivity is audience design. So thinking about, one of the first questions we ask a writer when we work with them is, who is your ideal audience? Tell us who you think you're talking to, and then it's our job to try to go out and get them in there. But then you also have to be willing to be part of that conversation. Um, and the, the other thing that's, I think, important about that is the conversation is not, did you like the play or not? That's the least interesting question about any play. And, and those of us who run institutions shouldn't be putting that question out. The question is, what did you take from the play? How do you interpret it? What meaning do you assign to the play? And the writer needs to be willing to be part of, to essentially position themselves as a public intellectual, and then they can really help in that, in that kind of feedback loop. It's exciting when it happens. I mean, that's engagement. And I think one of the big positive things that I, I learned just doing that, doing my left breast, was about engagement. It was also what you said about, oh my God, those people, they have stories. I'm not the only one with the story. And, and that they participated in the play with me, basically, and, uh, and came up to me afterwards. And in that same way, I think what the internet has done and is doing for all of us is the realization that we can actually and must actually communicate with our fans or our audiences or building, building those um, audiences and, and talking with them. And you're absolutely right about playwrights. We, we have to learn more about all aspects of it. Be willing to be part of the conversation. Be willing to be part of a production. You know, you know just stepping out of our comfort zone, I think. 
I, th I think there's a discussion that needs to be had about the community of people who face the blank page. Um, the, you know, that's a community that needs to talk to itself as well, and that's what this conference is about. But it's the, the community of writers. They, you learn so much from each other, and not only craft, I mean, part of what a guild is, in the traditional medieval sense, is the passing of wisdom and the, the creating of a community. And that goes back, you know, to the shaman in the cave, you know, dancing about the next hunt, um, to the internet. There's still someone who's creating that story, and often that story is being created in total isolation. And the feeling of isolation can be very dispiriting. You think you're the only one who's ever had to build that, you know, that, that cursor is blinking at you and demanding to be fed. You know, and nothing can happen until you fill it. You fill that page. So the pressure is on you, and you're alone in that room. And it's important, I think, for writers to come together and realize they're not alone. They're people have faced the exact same problem they are facing at that moment. Here's how I've, I dealt with this problem in this play. And that's a conversation to be had, but also simply the, the comradeship of knowing we're, we're together in this, you know, I think that's, that's facilitating that conversation is the most important thing I'm involved with. The reason I haven't said anything is I don't have any experience writing, you know, being a part of a theater community, uh, a specific theater community, and also because I'm embarrassed that I'm not very good technologically. And uh, I don't even want to be better. And so, <laughs> you know, when I hear Georgia talk about how well she's doing with that, you know, I feel a little envious. But I and then I become inspired, and I think I, I must go home and learn to tweet or Twitter. <laughs> Is anyone tweeting right now? Confess. Anybody? All right, good. Right there. I, you, I believe I understood you to, to ask us to describe the terrain that we find ourselves <coughs> in. And so I just wanted to hearken back to my terrain. Uh, when I was a child, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and there was a remarkable theater there called the Margot Jones Theater. And anyone who knows theater history knows that Margot Jones uh, made history by coming down to Dallas, which did not have any theater at all there. And started a repertory theater with a company, and one of the things she did was to premiere all of Tennessee Williams's works. So the reason that uh, that I'm somewhere between the best little whorehouse in Texas and a schizophrenic woman is because my mama thought it was kind of a good idea for us to go off on school nights and see the new Tennessee Williams plays at the Margo Jones Theater. And so I, I grew up on them, even though I was very young and they were inappropriate for me to be seen. <laughs> that's, that's the part between whorehouse and a schizophrenic woman. Uh, so here was the thing. I had then left Texas and I came to New York and I had my life and I traveled around. And in that time, I realized that not every city had a theater that did new plays all the time. And I was kind of amazed by that. I thought everyone had that. And it, I came to really appreciate it in retrospect. Now this last year when we were working on the we, being Larry Grossman, my composer, and Dwayne Poole, my book writer, when we were working on changing, uh, um, adapting the Truman Capote story, A Christmas Memory, into a musical, we were invited to go to two places. One of them was in Dayton, Ohio. It's a theater with a real tag name. Uh, the Human Race Theater. I think that's kind of a real tacky name myself. <laughs> so maybe you like it. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> but I have to tell you, these people in Dayton, Ohio, where, by the way, Stephen Schwartz has been very helpful to them and has helped them a lot, I think, in getting this program together. <coughs> They are so proud of doing new plays. They are so proud of doing new musicals. They ask us, 
<laughs> out it wasn't very fancy they opened up a rehearsal room and said that's it and we said well is there a stage manager no that's just it go in and do whatever you want to do <laughs> start writing finish writing start in the middle have a reading and we had 10 days there that were very helpful to us and after that we were invited out to the theater works in palo alto and that was a little more polished and it was wonderful and we ended up having a month long run. I'm not just meaning to be immodest to talk about myself, but what I was struck by was Dallas isn't the only place that has that anymore. Now there's the Human Race Theater in Dayton and there's Palo Alto and there's all of y'all's theaters. And the difference in the terrain that I see is that new works for all the problems, new works that's a phrase that's considered a good thing. And when I first came to New York, that was not necessarily considered a good thing. So I just thought I'd mention that to bring in a little positive touch to the, all our desperation that we've <laughs> experienced. On the subject of community, I think that one of the things that we all find uh, about the profession of working in the theater, that um, is by very definition community is 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 the relationship of all of those chairs that are facing that direction uh, and then there's a stage and what happens amongst those of us who are sitting in those chairs with what's happening on the stage and uh, just just two two experiences I've had in a, in a, in a theater in the last week uh, those of us on council uh, are Tony voters, so we see so much theater this time of year. But I saw Motherfucker with the Hat last week, and it was just extraordinary. A great piece of theater. And uh, lots of response from the audience, just great response uh, just toward the stage. A lot of leaning forward, a lot of, a lot of laughter, uh, a lot of people just being wrapped by what's happening on stage. And then at the end, a sense that we, the audience, had uh, both appreciated something and experienced something together. Nothing that we acknowledged with each other, but a sense uh, as you uh, rarely get in the theater, where, where you uh, have been through something with the audience because it was such a, an enthralling, intense piece of theater. The other couldn't have been more different. It was this morning watching Steve Schwartz um, do his um, talk about writing for musical theater. And somebody uh, in the audience asked if we could do a sing-along of all things. <laughs> and Stephen being Stephen said, of course. And uh, we came up with, I'm sure you could all think of what it would be. It would be day by day. And here we were at 11 a.m., or actually just 12 at that point, doing a sing-along of Day by Day, and it felt really good. <laughs> stage and his reason was that you know by very definition that yes you can train the animal but only so much and anything might happen I think at its best that's always true of theater it's why, it's why those of us who love this medium are so uncomfortable with anything that trends toward beating that life out of it and that we, we love when the actors are animals. We love when the work is bloody instead of careful. Not just from the actors, but from the director, from the writer, from the composer, from the designers. When the thing couldn't have happened anywhere but on a live stage. That shared experience, the shared experience of not knowing what these animals will do, what you will do, what, what any of us will feel, when this will end, how it will go. Um, that wouldn't happen in any other medium, and it, and it 
wouldn't happen. I agree with Stephen about the internet, and Stephen and I are the most backward people on earth. As far as using the internet, I'm even worse. I just got an email address this year. <laughs> and I keep it out very selectively because I don't want to use it. Um, the, the, the point I'm making though is as, as, as much as it does link you to the world, I think it's a way to, that people have of, of not, not being in the world and it, it allows them to actually be global in a, in a little box and I, 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 I think this is bloody. And I like this even though I'm shy, I like this. No. Craig, I want to respond to you and just say that I, um, I, I feel like the reason I'm at this table is because of the, the internet piracy and copyright thing that, that, that Craig and I are on that same committee. And that started with an email, and that was the, my way into this community, for which I'm very honored to be part. And so I think there's a, a combination of the best of both is what makes the experience a whole experience. I mean, theater is making something happen. And, yeah, I don't think any of us here would trade the opportunity to make something happen in just the way you described. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to make that opportunity. And in a way, that little black box, dad's garage, I would give anything to do that. And I have found another way to do that, which is the web. And I, I, putting on something that I feel as proud of as I do my work in any medium. Um, that's what counts. Uh, I don't think we need to exclude other things. You don't have to go on the You don't have to write email. I'm but sorry to have trashed it. I, it's well, actually something I don't understand. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's another discussion, and I don't want to take it up here, but a lot of people don't understand the plays I write. I, so, I mean, someone, you know, it, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean they're for everyone. They shouldn't be for everyone. Nothing should be for everyone. We should all have these individual distinct voices and places. I'm just saying to all these people, um, you want to write, you want to find a place to write. If you can do it on the stage, there's nothing that compares. But if you can do it for millions of people on a little screen, a big screen, out back on the street, that's theater. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, there are two people on stage, if I'm not mistaken, who haven't spoken yet, and I know by direct experience, <laughs> neither of them is at a loss for words characteristically, am I correct? So, I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys first crack at the next, uh, at the next flare, okay? And, and you can pass, if you want. Um, if you had a magic wand, or <coughs> if you were temporarily all-powerful, uh, and if there was something you could change about the state of living playwright production or the, the life of the playwright in the American theater, what would you do? Name or David? This is, I'm stealing. <laughs> I'm sta he told me to go first. Um, I'm stealing this from, I don't remember, Romulus Linney, I think. I would give every playwright a, a home in a theater. So you can do that. It's just an extraordinary experience to have playwrights in the, in the building every day. Um, it's an amazing thing, and I think you guys get a lot out of it, and I know I've worked in tiny theaters and big theaters and interns or mentees or whoever you want to talk about. Um, they're thrilled when the playwright is in the building. Um, and as a sidecar to that, Playwrights are the most powerful person in the theater. Everybody wants to know what you think <laughs> and why you wrote it and who you are and will you come and all of those things. And I think because you get beaten down so much um, in so many obscene ways that you forget how powerful you are. And um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, but it would be a home. I actually, I have a, um, 
I just have a small uh, technical gripe about the theater. If I could wave a wand, besides making some plates that I wrote disappear. <laughs> <laughs> and the plays of certain other playwrights disappear. <laughs> And certain directors I've worked with disappeared. <laughs> and this kid I went to grammar school with disappeared. Um, outside of that, um, I think that I have a, I have a um, my, my worry about the theater actually is, will sound small, but it's actually about casting. I feel as if casting is killing the theater because it's almost impossible now to get an actor to commit for four weeks of rehearsal and let's say, four weeks of, of a, or eight weeks of a, of a performance schedule in New York simply because of commercials, television programs, movies, the internet, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. Um, so um, it, is, it is getting so hard to find actors that you are always these days going up to the, up to the very line trying to find the people that you need. And as they say in Shakespeare in Love, it's a mystery. Somehow it always does happen. You always do find the person. It's always the right person. Um, no, I'd make some of those people disappear too. Um, <laughs> but actually, it's just, it's casting. Casting is the madness of theater. I, it's, it's, the one, it's the one area that has become nail-biting and unpleasant. And mega agents are, are killing us by, by um, for example, um, actors who, who have almost no credits in the theater now will not audition anymore. They, they need to be given an offer. And I find this appalling. And so that's, that's really my gripe. That's my magic wand is fix, fix casting, please. I'm going to toss out one other gripe. And this really, this comes out of uh, personal experience, although I'm not going to name any names. I see frequently that there are administrators in the theater there is an administrator in the theater who is getting a salary, a yearly salary, that is larger than the total budget of royalties paid to all the playwrights in that season. And I think there's something kind of corrupt about that. I get really tired. If we're so, if we're so bloody necessary, why are the playwrights almost always on the short end of the economic stick? You know. Yeah, this goes to my magic wand, it, yeah, exactly. which is, which is um, th there's a quote by a former Guild President, Robert Anderson, which may be apocryphal, but I like to think that it's not, uh, which is, he said, you can make a killing in the theater, but not a living. And if I were to wave that magic wand, it would be to allow artists, writers to make a living, um, so that they don't have to take jobs elsewhere so that they can focus on this craft and they don't have to desert it to make to put braces on their kids' teeth. Great. David's magic wand was a little more murderous actually on the killing side, but yes. we'll, 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 we'll forget. <laughs> uh, I have one more sort of uh, question that I'd like to throw out, and you guys have been fantastic by the way, and then we're going to open the floor for uh, commentary. This question is um, has sort of an A and a B part, and you can answer either one or, or neither. Uh, the, the theme of collaboration has been a big one uh, for the last few days. It's come up tonight, even uh, glancingly, uh, both in positive and negative terms. And the theme of education has come up both tonight and throughout the conference. Some people have spoken very movingly about the transformative effects of, of their education and training or, or the deformative effects <laughs> of their education and training. Um, and so, just to kind of throw both topics out at once, I'd like to know if anybody has sort of a, a telegram that they would like to send to the educational institutions of the world uh, that deal in theater, uh, or other subjects, by the way, because theater, of course, is not typically about theater, it's usually about the world, and, and we have something to do with that, too. Uh, and, or, uh, a telegram you'd like to send to a, to a mythical collaborator to, to get him or her on board with, with you. As a, as a collaborative artist. So that's a lot of stuff to think about, but write those telegrams and, and whoever's, whoever's got an answer, either on the education. I've got a telegram. I've got a telegram. I do teach. And it was like, it, it would be, don't be so afraid <laughs> of the professionals. Um, you know, it just, it just seems like there is, has been this big chasm that conforms itself to this 
ridiculous sentence, those who can do, those who can't teach, and uh, uh, straddling both sides of it the way I do, it's preposterous. And we are destroying each other. And we're destroying the, the students as well. So I would just send a telegram that says, we can love each other. <laughs> I'm never this positive, by the way. And your telegram would say, we can love each other. Stop. Yes. We can love each other. Stop. Anybody else? Education or collaboration or, or, or anything well, else? When you talk about telegram, I think about international um, communication. And one of the most exciting advents of the last decade is the proliferation of the availability of scripts from, uh, by playwrights from other countries. It, uh, ten years ago, you'd have to wait for an airmail submission. Uh, now, as, as playwrights the world over have realized they're just a click away, they've been doing the $500 translation fee. They've been asking theaters to pay all of $1,000 to get a work translated, and we've been willing to do that and uh, the rate of submission has increased exponentially. That's not competition for playwrights of the Dramatist Guild. Those are only more opportunities for playwrights of the Dramatist Guild to be involved in the translating of work that um, is being done overseas. The telegram I would send would be to the Arab world and the Arab Spring and the, the, all the confusion coming out of it. And why don't we get to see some of those plays being written right now that we could share and that would reveal so much more than what we're seeing on CNN? Uh, we get the heart, we get the soul of what's happening um, across the world and finally understand something. I'm going to back up the telegram that, uh, that made, and, and my telegram is don't be afraid, but it's not to the writers. It's to all the people who nurture, produce, direct, and populate the casts of those plays. I say to theaters, don't be afraid, um, even though I know it's an economic reality, don't be afraid to cast someone who doesn't have so many people that you can't get the script to, you know, like David said. Um, don't be afraid of material that, you know, uh, isn't completely um, accessible the moment you look at it. Um, just don't be afraid to take a chance on somebody new whose play didn't wasn't a hit last year. Um, you know, just go for broke. We do. Yep. I think my telegram, both to collaborators and to educators, would be be open to the possibility that. Um, First, in terms of education, I, I cited a story earlier today that I, I got my undergraduate degree is in music theory and composition, but I went to a liberal arts school and, and we had such requirements we had to take history and philosophy and German and all these things. And I remember saying to my composition professor, why do I have to study all these things? And he said, if you are going to be a writer, you have to have something to write about. You have to have a point of view about the world so that you have something to write about. And so. As writers, we have to be open to the possibility, and that is one interpretation of that phrase. But also, as collaborators, I think we get stuck in, um, this is how I see it, this is how it has to be, and the other collaborator is saying, that won't work, this is how it has to be. And with the same sort of open to possibility, I find that break, sometimes the only way to get past that conflict is to just say, okay, let's just imagine for a moment that you might be right. What would that mean? <laughs> and that's usually where the breakthrough happens. So I think it, it goes to both situations. Any other telegraphers? I would send a, a, a telegram to uh, new playmakers in New York from new playmakers outside of New York and also <laughs> back and forth to St. Pi. Uh, no, uh, but uh, calling, for, calling for greater collaboration between new playmakers uh, in, uh, in New York and in working at regional theater and greater transparency between new playmakers. Uh, in those two places, in those many places. Because if we've heard anything about community, uh, there are more communities around the country, at least in my traveling that I've found, that are making playwrights, trying to make put playwrights at the center of the communities, at the center of civic life, at the center of, uh, uh, and certainly at the center of institutions, which has just been thrilling to see. So let, I would call for that. Let, let, me, let me just toss out a, a small anecdote about what has changed, though. A number of years ago, I was writing a book 
called Something Wonderful Right Away, which is an oral history of Second City, and I was trying to uh, market it to uh, the typical uh, uh, publishers of theater books in New York. And I was talking to an editor, and he said, now let me get this straight, you're writing about a theater in Chicago. I said, oh yeah. I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, nothing important happens in theater in Chicago. <laughs> and uh, eventually, obviously, it got published, and it's been in print, and uh, has done very well. Uh, nobody would dream of saying that anymore. Uh, once upon a time, everything that we thought was of value in the American theater started within the Broadway economy and then was distributed to the rest of the country. Now, uh, New York is frequently the last stop, and I think that's, that is a healthy change. I think that the fact that stuff is springing up all over the place and ends up on Broadway rather than uh, having to start on one island is, is, is the big news of the last 35, 40 years. It's, uh, the, the river basically, basically has reversed its course. And I think that's very helpful. My telegram would go to uh, theater goers from out of New York, uh, coming to New York to see shows. Um, and that would be to be, to be adventurous. Um, I, I notice uh, them going into Red Lobster. <laughs> and that there's a correlation between that restaurant and perhaps a show they would choose. <laughs> and uh, I once was in trying, I was trying to impress a woman that I was dating in my early 40s, I, so I went to church with her uh, once. And um, it was the last time I was in a church, but I heard something good. Um, the minister said, uh, why would you choose comfort when God offers you ecstasy. And uh, that's, to me, the choice between the Red Lobster show or the one that maybe would offer you ecstasy. And they seem to choose Red Lobster a lot, those Red Lobster shows. And uh, I, I wish they would venture out and surprise themselves and us. I, I'd like to say something in regards to education. And I can't phrase it as a telegram. But one thing that I constantly worry about is that the plays we write are no longer at the center of the public square. It seemed like there's a time when Arthur Miller would write about a social issue and it would suddenly pop up in the New York Times. And, and we were a big part of popular culture and we helped to dictate the public debate about current social issues. And I don't think that happens with our plays in the theater anymore. But I do think it happens when those same plays find themselves in educational and academic communities. Mm -hmm. and, and as a quick example, my dear friend Moises Kaufman wrote The Laramie Project, modest success off Broadway in New York, went on for three years running to be the most produced play at American universities. After that, for three or four more years, it actually hit the high school market. And I think when you look at the trajectory, certainly, of gay and lesbian politics in this country, and you see the generational shift, honest to God, I sincerely believe half those kids did that play in high school. So, so our worry that we are no longer in a position to incite public debate or address social concern or modify ways of thinking, I think we still can but it's not necessarily on our stages. It's those same plays operating in the classroom. Yeah. And that's a connection. Yeah. That and that is the very definition of a national conversation. And a, a perfect way to close this part of the proceedings and open up, uh, first of all, open up the house lights a little bit, if you, if you will. And we have about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions and engagement from the audience. And you, ma'am, were first. Uh, I'd like to address the uh, uh, comment that Ari made uh, about your uh, Arab Spring people. At the First International Women Playwrights Conference in 1988, we had uh, hundreds of women every couple of years meeting around the world. We had an Iraqi woman and a playwright and an Iranian woman on the same stage. And at every single one of these conferences, a number of women have been imprisoned for what they write. 
little piece about a woman uh, who was in prison and about to die for a uh, crime she didn't commit um, and, and torture. And a number of these women, by the way, have been tortured in our playwrights. And afterwards, one of the Cyprian playwrights came up to me and she said, my feet, I still have trouble walking. And they knew what she meant. Um, but it takes it to another realm, and we're so privileged to be able to do what we do. And, and so many people said, I'm so happy to be doing what I'm doing, and we have to take that elsewhere and bring the world to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, uh, I've been asked to ask you, oh, you're very good. Stand and, and project. And if you can't hear in the, in the back, let me know and I'll rephrase. I remember back in the day, Playhouse 90 was a very popular show on TV, and it made theater, it brought theater into the homes. Is there any effort afoot to recreate something like Playhouse 90 for a modern audience? You know, I, I think you're not going to find much of that on, on American TV. Uh, paradoxically, there's an enormous amount, I've been uh, sharing this with friends, there's an enormous amount on British radio. Every day on Radio 4, there's a new 45-minute play with their leading actors and writers. Every, every weekend, they do a major production. Uh, we should be ashamed of ourselves because our, our radio and, and television aren't supporting uh, uh, the dramas the way that British radio does. And British radio covers American culture better than we do. There is a current trend in filming live theater and broadcasting into movie theaters. Uh, the National, I think, has a program, uh, and there's some of that going on here. Sweeney, uh, a company is going to be on uh, the screens this Wednesday. There you go. Um, it, it does remain to be seen. I mean, theater is a live experience, and whether that experience can be replicated adequately in a, in a film version, I, I don't think has been demonstrated, at least to me. Um, but it is an outlet for people who don't have access, certainly to a lot of live theater, uh, can't afford that, and uh, it's a way of these works being given a new life. And a market for the artists as well. Uh, okay. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, is that Roland? Yeah. Hi. Uh, one of the recurring themes that I've noticed over these past few days has been that we're, uh, we're, we're all engaged in the creation of an art form uh, for which uh, the audiences are dwindling year after year after year. I'm wondering if the people up here have any advice for us, if there are any things that we can be doing to try to reverse that trend. We had a conversation last night um, at dinner with someone who is not a playwright, um, but is uh, a very in intelligent gentleman involved in, in marketing and branding, etc. And he took a very interesting position. He said that he felt that um, that was actually changing, and that we have an extraordinary um, opportunity in the future because um, as, as has been cited here a lot, people are so increasingly isolated at their computers and, and at their um, Crackberries and at their, their iPads and, and, and um, etc. That there's that the experience of, um, of community that, that exists only really in live theater ha has started to seem um, cool again and attractive and you start to see um, you start to see he, he was talking about um, things like glee and and the fact that that's celebrating live theater and um, and and certain other things that are sort of um, cool and and upcoming and so I, I actually challenge the assertion that it's 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 a shrinking audience and a, and a, and a um, and an art form that's becoming less relevant, and that that trend is only going to go in that direction. I'm not at all sure that's the case, um, and and I think that we can. Um, it's sort of what somebody was saying about about owning our own power. That there is something about the experience of of live theater and and, and a live event um, that is becoming so rare these days. Um, 
that it's in terms of in terms of our lives um, that that the, the the interaction with people um, in a live in live form is 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 dwindling, and therefore the experience of live theater becomes um, more precious and more attractive. So uh, I think I. I you know, I, I, I sort of challenge this assertion uh, a bit, and maybe that's um, naive or, or Pollyannish of me, but when I heard that said, it, it, it did make a lot of sense. So I think what we do about it is, is, to, um, is to write things that, uh, that are engaging um, live and, and do um, create an, an event, a live event between the audience and the, and the play. And, uh, and see what happens. I, I'm going to bet those numbers, though, also don't include what is perhaps the largest expanding genre of theater that's going on in America, which is improvisational theater. Uh, thousands of troops across the country, professional, uh, high school, college, whatever. It's Nobody's getting royalties, and certainly nobody's going to make a living at doing it. But there are people all over the country that are crowding into small rooms to watch the groups make up stories spontaneously on their suggestions in front of them. And uh, I, I know that those, that's not in, the, in these numbers. It's a different kind of theater. None of us is going to make a living from it, but it is legitimately a kind of theater. I, th I think what we may see is that the subscription model and those subscription audiences, which has been the sort of driving economic engine of a lot of the regional theater movement, is going to collapse. And, and when it does, um, you know, creative marketing directors are going to find new ways of reaching new audiences, and it, and it may, in the long run, be liberating for the whole field. Um, and, and we may feel we're back on the front lines of where that movement was originally, which is, you know, each play is 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 a, is a new thing, and with that, and we need to reach out to new audiences and, and new creative ways. Right. That that may be a, a, a great trend in the future. I think the low tech nature of theater. Oh, sorry. Uh, the low-tech nature of theater is what it's going to be its salvation. You can't download it. You can't scan it. You can't videotape it. You can, but then it becomes something else. Theater is, as Stephen was saying, a live experience. And it's that experience that people have always been hungry for and will always be hungry for. Certainly, theater going as a, as a cultural phenomenon is, used to be something that was habitual. When I was a kid, my parents were middle class people from Brooklyn. We, we always went into the theater. We got half price tickets and we sat upstairs and we saw, you know, these people's work and, and it made me care about that. Um, I found, I find perhaps the succeeding generations less, that it's less part of their everyday life. But I think what's growing is in, off, off Broadway, the, the $20 show, the people, putting on the Mickey and Judy, putting on their own show, um, but they're speaking to the, their own generation in their own language, and they're talking about things that are of concern to them. And I don't know if those numbers reflect how much those theaters are bursting at the seams, and how much of that is going on, not just in New York, but everywhere. And the explosion of French festivals all over the place. Don't get me started. <laughs> 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 on French festivals? Yeah. Uh, I, I think though that the, that the number of alternate media for storytelling um, creates for us in the theater the challenge of doing what 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 the, only the theater does best you know we have to do the mo the thing that you have to be there in order to see it you have to ha you have to be in the theater in order to get the effect of Bernadette Peter singing to you you can't you know you whatever that is that we do that is the most theatrical the most that, you know, we have to do the thing that nobody else can do. The TV can't do, that web can't do, that, that film can't do, that nobody can do. And if we, and if we stick to that, we'll be okay. Because as Ralph said, you can't duplicate that thing that you had to be there in order to see it. Um, and that, that, I think, is, the, is, a, is our great hope. That's what we teach all the time, which is we, we have to push further and further into the land of where only we know how to do this. Uh, I mean, the, the great success of Spider-Man would, would be a really interesting, despite all of the hoopla about it, the fact that you sit there and these things are flying over your head. Yes, you can see that in Las Vegas, but, you know, it's that, it, that's a big, that's that kind of thinking on a big scale, similar 
the, similarly, the Bo Willimon production of Balm and Gilead last week that was put up and disappeared in 24 hours. <coughs> Everybody that wasn't there, apparently, is just an idiot and I'll be in that list. But, uh, but you know, those, whatever the edges are of, of, of the writing world in the theater, that's where we have to be. Well, you know, War Horse is maybe a better example than Spider-Man because uh, Spider-Man really occurred about publicity. War Horse has happened. I mean, that's a story that doesn't seem to be of, of intrinsic, you know, you, you, if you describe what that story is about, you wouldn't think like, gee, everybody in the world is, is going to kill to see that. But, the, the, but it's done in such a way, you can only do what they're doing in War Horse in live theater. You can't do that story on film and have the same effect. You can't do it on television. You can't do it... Um, live streaming on the media. You, but you sit in that theater and you are seeing something that can only be done in the theater and, the, and people are killing to get it because of that. Well, I was thinking about what you were saying before about people wanting and being hungry to, to go to the theater because, it, because of what theater is and it's live and then you are communicating and you're not under headsets. But I'm also thinking that the Red Rooster plays are not going to make you feel that way or whatever. Red Lobster? Red Lobster. Red Lobster. <laughs> since I started writing writing plays. It's like, this is only one thing, and that's what it is. It's for the theater. But I was thinking about the, is it the free theater, Belarus, uh, yeah. that I was fortunate enough to get, you know, tickets to um, last time they were in New York doing the Pinter. Um, yeah, yeah so being, being Harold yeah. Okay, that was something where the audience really did connect, not just with that, but with one another. I mean, we, we were in that. You know, and that kind of thing, you know, more of <laughs> that kind of thing because it was theatrical and it was addressing something that we need to know about. We need to make that kind of work and we need to tell our story better that that's what we do because the truth is that, the, the truth is it is much easier every day to not go out and not to leave your house. And I, I don't think we can ignore that. It's true. Every, I mean, if people are not going to the theater more and more because it's so easy to call up whatever you want on the craft carrier or the iPad. So we have to be out there telling that story that what you are getting in this theater tonight, you will only ever get that night here and that is something special and important. So. We are almost out of time, I regret to say, and uh, Mame Hunt is gesticulating in such a way that tells me that she has a summative remark to make. I'll be very brief. Stop writing realism. <laughs> There we go. Well, as we, as we hoped, as we feared, as we, as we knew, uh, this has become a, a wonderful national conversation with some wonderful artists. Please join me in thanking the panel.
once we go to like the eyebrow line, we may as well fly the array. Yeah. Yeah, you need to see the, uh... And it's going to be a big 